me to be allowed uh, to speak on intestinal ultrasound. I hope uh, the voice and the images are there. If not, please let me know. So my um, uh, talk today is on the point of care intestinal ultrasound and IBD, a tool for the gastroenterologist. Uh, not that's just the gastroenterologist, but the point of care ultrasound. I'm always getting very excited about intestinal ultrasound. I try to stay in, in time because uh, I can take the talk forever on intestinal ultrasound. Let me show you one example. That's a 32-year-old female patient. She has Crohn's disease. She's clinically asymptomatic. She came to my IBD clinic. I didn't see her for a year. She is on immunosuppressive therapy. She was sitting across from me and saying, I'm doing absolutely fine. Uh, no symptoms, normal stool frequency, uh, no abdominal pain, no fever, nothing. So in normal routine care, you probably would draw blood and maybe uh, look for a stool sample and then usually continue therapy. Now, since she wasn't in our IVD clinic for some time, we performed intestinal ultrasound. And what you can see here is in the right lower quadrant, that's the terminal ileum that's inflamed. And then you see that this straight line here is interrupted. This is a small fish in an abscess. If you have never seen an intestinal ultrasound, I understand that it's difficult to see right now. If you have seen a few ultrasounds, it's very quick and easy to see that something is not okay here. So clearly, clinical remission, like in that patient, doesn't mean deep remission. And we cannot perform endoscopy on patients every few months, and especially like the abscesses we might have missed on endoscopy. So we need further objective imaging. And then the question is, which cross-sectional imaging modality is non-invasive, requires no preparation, is without ionizing radiation, can be performed by a physician on the spot, immediately delivering data, including real-time observation of the bowel peristalsis and the three options, CT, MRE, or intestinal ultrasonography, and uh, as I'm talking about intestinal ultrasound, C is the right answer to that uh, question. So, um, is that, that just something that I think is very helpful, or do we already have uh, guidelines suggesting to use intestinal ultrasound? If, if we look at the most recent version of the ECHO-ESCA diagnostic guidelines, and I will show you detailed statements later on, but in various statements, you have intestinal ultrasound or transmural response that should be measured. And then it always states either MRE or uh, intestinal ultrasound. So in various different statements of the ECHO guidelines published in 2019, intestinal ultrasound is one of the cross-sectional imaging modalities you can use for monitoring IBD. Now, are you as an IBD monitoring activity? What to look for? Those of you who have not done intestinal ultrasound yet, First, you have to have a structure. You need to know what you want to look for. And you can see here A, B, C, D, E. It's the different steps of examining the colon and then the terminal ileum and later on, then the uh, sweep over the small bar. So the colon and the terminal ileum are very nice and easy to see. I'm starting the video. And you can see here, that's how long it takes to follow the ascending colon. So it's not an examination that takes forever but that was like looking at a normal ascending colon. And if we look at the image that you would see, this right here is the normal rostration of a normal uh, ascending colon. So you can see here, and I will show you the different layers later on, that's the normal bow wall of the ascending colon. Now, what are the parameters to look for? The most important parameter in all clinical trials is bow wall thickness. Here you can see the propus up here, and then you see the three layers. This is the intestinal lumen, and then you have the blackish here is the mucosa, white submucosa muscularis, that's 2.2 millimeters. You see that down here, that's normal. And then you see an inflamed uh, current disease patient, that's air in the lumen. Black mucosa, white submucosa muscularis, that's seven millimeters, that's severely thick. And I think every one of you can see the difference. Then you can look for vascularization. Lots of vascularization meaning lots of inflammation, no vascularization, meaning less inflammation and more fibrosis. And you can see here that's clearly a large difference compared to over here. Next parameter to look for is bowel wall stratification. This is again the air and the lumen, this white line, then mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, three layers. And if you look towards the right, there is no stratification anymore. Then you look beyond the bowel wall, and the most important parameter to look for is the mesenteric fatty proliferation. We know that this is a sign of inflammation and that also helps you to find the inflamed bowel because you have this blackish dark inflamed bowel and then uh, this is surrounded by this whitish 
mesenteric fatty proliferation. So that's look for you can look for free fluid and for lymph adenopathy. And then you look for motility. On the left is a normal uh, terminal eye, and you see this nice contraction. There's a nice movement. And when I start the one on the right, it's also a terminal ileum. But the movement you see is from the probe moving forward, but the bowel itself here is very stiff. So you see that there's hardly any motility in this terminal ileum as a sign of uh, pathology. If you want to read more details on what and how to look for, there's an expert consensus paper by the IBIS uh, group uh, published uh, recently, and in that uh, paper you find the Barworth thickness, the IFET, the color Doppler sigma, and Barworth stratification, and the different um, categories, and you also find an explanation of how Barworth thickness measurement should be done. That's a very nice overview to look at if you want to see more details. Then the next question is, do we have an activity score like an endoscopy? We do have various activity scores for Crohn's disease as well as for ulcerative colitis, just two examples here. And most of them are reviewed by an Australian uh, um, not very nice review paper. But so far, we don't have a really validated score. And the National Bowel Assistant Group is currently with a support of HOMSI working on development of such a score. We are halfway through, and hopefully in one and a half years, we have a validated activity score for intestinal ultrasound and Crohn's disease as well. Now, how should we do it? within uh, uh, treating our patients so for Crohn's disease. The echo ester statement uh, suggests clinical and biochemical response to treatment of Crohn's disease should be determined within 12 weeks following initiation of therapy. And then in its copy, that transmural response should be evaluated within six months. Now, what is the data? So how responsive is the bowel? How quickly or how fast do we see changes? And uh, since the time is limited, I'm just going to show you very few data sites just to give you an idea. And there's lots more data published. So that is one of the larger trials, the TRUST study in 47 IBD centers, including 234 patients. And the aim was to see in patients that have a, an acute flare and get a treatment, an inflammatory treatment, to monitor uh, the intestinal ultrasound changes. And the ultrasound was done at baseline at 3, 6, and at 12 months. And if you see here at baseline for the terminal ileum as well as ascending transverse descending and thickmoid colon, uh, there has been thickening pathologic. And then already at three months, you see significant decrease in response to anti inflammatory therapy. So, highly significant proportion of patients with normalization of bowel thickness under therapy. Another trial, the Stardust IUS sub study that is, has just been accepted for publication in clinical gastroenterology and hepatology. In that large trial, a sub study was added and intestinal ultrasound was performed in a subgroup of patients at weeks 0, 4, 8, 16, and 48 weeks. All the patients have had a flare of the Crohn's disease and were treated with ustekinumab. And then if we look at the response, you see here on the left side, dark blue is the response, which is a bowel reduction of 25% or more at four weeks. And you see that in 19% of patients, you have a significant bowel reduction at four weeks. It's increasing over time. Transmural response, meaning complete normalization, up to 18% at week 48. So here in that trial, you could clearly see that already at four weeks after initiation of therapy, you receive in those patients. Uh, who respond to therapy, a response also on intestinal ultrasound. How about ulcerative colitis? Another uh, uh, larger trial with more than 200 patients. In that trial, patients received an ultrasound at baseline, two weeks, six weeks, and 12 weeks. All patients had to have a flare at baseline. And if you look here, 90% uh, had a pathologic bowel thickening um, at baseline in the sigmoid, 80, more than 80% in the descending colon. And look here at two weeks, significant normalization. That's not just reduction, but complete normalization at two weeks. So the bowel thickness, especially in ulcerative colitis, is very responsive to therapy and hopefully helps us to decide if the patient is a responder or non-responder. Now the question is, is transmural remission a predictor for long-term outcome in IBD? And again, there are various studies have been published. I'm just showing you two, uh, two Italian studies. One from Rome, a pre-therapy intestinal ultrasound was performed. Patients then received anti-TNF therapy. At 18 months, another intestinal ultrasound was performed. And then the patients were grouped into complete responders, meaning complete transmural remission. 
after responders and non responders. And then one year later, another uh, um, investigation of the patients were done. And then the follow up after one year showed that the ones who were complete responders at this 18 month interval had no surgery, small amounts of steroids, and fewer hospitalizations. So, suggesting that those patients that showed complete transmural remission have a better long term outcome. Another, a bit larger trial, a prospective cohort study again from Italy, 218 current disease patients, one year outcome depending on transmural mucosal or no healing. Transmural healing was defined as bowel thickness of 30 millimeters or less, mucosal healing as an SESCD of two or less. And if we look at the different parameters here, steroid free clinical remission at one year, those patients who had at baseline transmural healing, 95.6% were in steroid free remission after one year, 75% with mucosal healing. If we look at clinical relapse, the ones who had transmural healing, only 4.4% had a relapse after one year, compared to 25% who only had a mucosal healing. If we look at need for hospitalization, 8.8% of the patients after one year had a Rehospitalization compared to 28 only hope having mucosal healing, and none of the patients with transmural healing had surgery within the one year. So, also a clear indicator that a transmural remission is a sign that a patient is most likely to have a less severe cause over the next year. And again, another uh, a systematic review article with expert consensus statements defining transabdominal intestinal treatment, response, and remission in IBD. Uh, for those who are interested, I recommend to read that uh, paper from Joan Ilgemar from Copenhagen. IBS and IBD, second part is detecting complications. And I'm just going to show you after the echo escal statements a few examples to just give you an idea what you can find. So echo escal says that cross-sexual imaging should be used to detect small bowel structures. Due to radiation exposure with CT, the preferred methods are MR and or intestinal ultrasound. Cross-sectional imaging can detect internal penetrating disease and intraabdominal abscesses with varying accuracy. And MRI is preferred to ultrasound for deep-seated fissures. And then for follow-up monitoring, it's again IOS and MRI suggested as the both, uh, both uh, equal imaging methods. Now, uh, just a very few examples, 38-year-old patients, cholamic Crohn's disease with involvement of the transverse colon, increased stool frequency, occasional cramping mid-upper abdomen, CIP normal, just a slightly increased fecal caprotectin. We performed an intestinal ultrasound, and you see that's already from 2008. I'm keeping that on purpose because that's an older machine, and even with the older machine, you can see what, that there's a stricture when I start the video. This is uh, the right side of the transverse colon where all the stool is collected and then the stool is pressed through the stricture which is not opening up. I'm starting the video and then you see right here, see here the stool is pressed through here but this white line is not increasing, it's not unfolding because it's a fixed stricture. So this motility, looking at the motility and over time you see that there is a clear stricture. Um, next patient, 20 year old patient, current uh, collapsed for several years. Increased true frequency, various consistency, you no know, blood, uh, abdominal cramping, fever, uh, double immunosuppression, uh, CRP is uh, uh, significantly elevated, caprotectin not done. We performed an intestinal ultrasound, just a basic one, and we saw that there is an inflammatory mass, and we were not sure if it's just an inflammatory mass with all the inflamed bowel segments in it, or could that be an abscess behind it? What you can then do, you apply contrast media IV. And this you can see on the left side. And it's quite simple. If it is an abscess, you won't see any perfusion. It just stays a black area. If there is uh, perfusion, so it's just an inflammatory mass, you will see the bubbles everywhere. So I start the video. And then over time, and I hope your rooms are dark enough to see this, you will see that there are no bubbles. All here, that's all uh, tissue that's perfused. And here, that's the abscess, which is quite large which was not as easy to see before. And then you can see, okay, there is an abscess. You can drain it either by intestinal ultrasound or by CT or MRI. Two more cases. 19-year-old patient, RA Crohn's disease, known for two years. Elevated temperatures, recurrent abdominal cramping, right lower quadrant, slightly elevated CIP and uh, carprotectin and on therapy. 
Now we look here at the bladder of the patient and we know she has an algal disease. And you see here, this bladder is completely normal, the surrounding here. And there's an interruption right here. This is an enterovesical fistula with air bubbles in here. This is the darkest tract right here. So by intestinal ultrasound, you could clearly depict the uh, algal disease and then the enterovesical fistula, uh, meaning that this patient had to go for surgery. You can also use your probe for perineal ultrasound, same probes, like in this patient, 26 year old patients, algal colonic Crohn's disease known for six years, routine visit to IVD clinic for infliximab infusion, no abdominal symptoms, new painful perineal pain for last three days, lab results not yet available. So it's patient sitting across from you telling you, oh, there is a, a severe pain perineal. Just from inspection, I couldn't see anything. And I placed the same probe you use for intestinal ultrasound. You just place it in a glove with a gel. And this here is the anus right here, this blackish tract. And then this here is a small abscess. So very quick and easy. That was a larger abscess and then that patient was sent for surgery. Now, just some examples, uh, lots more to show, but uh, due to time, just to give you an idea. One thing we should always keep in mind is point of care intestinal ultrasound might improve patient understanding of the disease. And Friedman from Melbourne performed a very nice study, and he showed that the gastroenterologist performed point of care ultrasound improved patient understanding of the disease activity, symptomatology, management decision clinical outcomes, so IUS may improve adherence with treatment and clinical outcomes. And that's the nice, the beauty of point of care sound. You can talk to your patient, you can explain, okay, you feel better, but the inflammation is still ongoing, we need to continue therapy, and yourself, you get an impression if there is a response or not. So it suggests that monitoring algorithm, um, looking at all the different data is, at an active IBD, you perform an intestinal ultrasound, CFP, PK, carprotectin, Endoscopy only if this might add additional uh, necessary information. You start your therapy. If you have a severe flare, you already look at four to six weeks ago after three months with intestinal ultrasound. You follow up again after six months. Maybe you add an endoscopy and then after one year. And the idea is to determine transmural response short term, monitoring with objective markers, not just uh, do you feel better or not, rule out complications, optimize therapy, and to determine endoscopic remission and transmural remission long term. Current limitation, IUS is not yet standard in all IBD centers around the world, uh, so there's definitely a need for teaching and for it. On the training curriculum, which we developed because we, there was such a huge demand of people from various countries approaching it of how can we learn it. It's a, a three-part module. The one is a two or two and a half day introductory hands-on workshop where you learn what to look for, how to look for, and it's a four-week hands-on training in an IBIS certified training center. And then we have a third model, which is currently the Echo Advanced Ultrasound Workshop next year in Copenhagen, where we most likely will have various uh, uh, part three models around the world. One is coming closer to your region as well. So this year we have one in Athens, one in Milan, and we will have one in New York in September. Next year we start in Chicago. One will be in Europe, most likely in Liverpool in next May. And then there will be in India the first week of the November of next year. So all of you who are really dedicated, interested to learn intestinal ultrasound, take a look at our IBIS homepage. We will upload more detailed information in India within the next four weeks, hopefully, but you can already look at the different other workshops and one will be in Japan. My last slide, monitoring in IBD the future. I think uh, with more intense monitoring, we will have more remote controlling at home, CFP, pick up And then on a frequent basis, we have patients come in for point of care intestinal ultrasound. It's quick, it's easy to do, it's non-invasive. It's once you have the machine, it's a lot cheaper than many of the other imaging methods. And I definitely is not uh, it's a very good imaging method, nothing against MRI, it's just the availability of the time and the cost of uh, the imaging. And I think that's where IOS can jump in to do the short-term point of care ultrasound, and then you definitely need to test uh, MRI uh, frequently as well. And with that, I'm done with my presentation.